This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. In case you can't tell, today I am particularly fired up because one of my favorite tools just got a massive software update. And I don't think it's hyperbolic to say that this software update is a complete game changer. Side note, how funny is it to say I got a software update for a tool? I mean, yeah, you get software updates for your phone and for your computer, but it's not every day you get one for a tool. Longtime viewers of the channel will know that I am a big fan of my X-Carve CNC. However, there is one aspect of it that I find kind of lacking. There's just not that much of a community behind the X-Carve. I mean, don't get me wrong, there is definitely a very active community on ESOL, but the size and the scope of it is kind of limited because it's limited to other people who own X-Carves. Compared to some other hobbies like 3D printing, where there are literally millions of people sharing and open sourcing their own designs, it just kind of pales in comparison. Like the other day I was looking at this website Thingiverse or maybe Thingiverse, and there were all sorts of cool open source design. There were retro game consoles, there were speaker designs. I was just blown away by the community that exists for 3D printing. And it just made me so jealous. Like why doesn't something like that exist for my beloved CNC? And that is why I think this software update is so game-changing. Inventables has just released a software update for the x -Car that basically turns it into a 3D printer. Or, well, not quite, but pretty damn close. Let me explain. So the software update that I'm talking about is called ESOL 3D. And what it allows you to do is import STL files into ESOL. Now, for those of you who don't know, STL files are the same files that 3D printers run on. So what this effectively allows you to do is import all of the designs from the 3D printing community and then carve them on your X carve. This is amazing because it gives you access to millions of really high quality open source designs that you are free to tinker with at home. And that is exactly what we're gonna do today. I went on Thingiverse, I found a really cool design for a speaker cabinet, and we are going to make it out of some solid walnut. Now, obviously the X-Carve is still a CNC at the end of the day. So you have to start with a solid block of material and then whittle that down into the shape you want. But the magic of Easel 3D is that it does a great job of figuring out all the tool paths for you. It's basically as easy as dragging and dropping the STL files. However, just because setting up the carve is easy doesn't mean that actually doing the carve is also easy. In fact, this carve was pretty risky. You see, in order to cut deep enough to make this speaker cabinet, I had to use a four inch long bit. But with a bit that long, you're applying an incredible amount of force at its very tip. Even with this thick boy quarter inch bit, there was a really good chance that it might snap. So in order to compensate, I turned the speed of my x carve way down. For the first hour or so, I was making slow but steady progress. Then I heard a loud bang followed by some pretty horrible noises. <laughs> me. It's about five o'clock and uh, my carve just failed in multiple ways. Even though I was being super conservative with the settings, I still managed to break the bit and to break the carve. So now I have no choice other than to start again. And it's a two and a half hour carve. I, yeah, I'm going to be in the shop pretty late today. Oh, crap. On the second attempt, I realized that I was an idiot. I didn't have to carve the entire speaker in one pass. In fact, Easel 3D made it really easy to split the carve up into two parts. And now that I was only carving two inches of material at a time, I was able to crank the speed way up and get these carves done a lot faster. Oh, and rather than using tabs, I actually undercarved each half of the speaker, leaving like a 16th of solid wood, which I then removed over on my drum sander. This is just a nice, gentle way to sneak up on the cut, and it leaves you with a smooth surface that's ready for glue. My method of doing it in two pieces worked, and this portion of it is going to be very satisfying. Oh, yeah. I like this bit. You can see here that port of the speaker is actually fluted, so it starts big and then it gets small, and then eventually it tapers to almost nothing when it enters the actual cabinet. My plan now is to take this half, and then take this half and glue them together. It's what I probably should have done from the start to avoid all this mess, but hey, you live and you learn, right? I want to do a very thin bead. Oh, come on, not that 
thin, so thin that it's non-existent. Come on, glue bottle, work with me here. Normally, I just tell people to go buck wild with glue. I mean, glue is cheap and you can just wipe off any squeeze out. But this was a bit of a different story. Because of all the tight inside corners, I couldn't really get in there to clean out any excess glue. So I was really conservative here and tried to apply just enough to get the job done. That's not bad, that's not bad at all. Okay, now, be very careful. Keep all of our alignments tight. Just like with the glue, I wasn't really gonna be able to sand out any minor alignment issues. So I was taking my time here and making sure everything was perfect. And then this happened. <gasps> oh, damn, I knew that was gonna happen. It split into two pieces. Uh, you know what? It kind of sucks, but it's actually gonna be relatively easy to fix that. And it'll make the rest of the construction easier. So we're just gonna kind of roll with it, whatever. So now we can get in there, we can clean out all the glue that's squeezed out in the middle. Oh, this build is not turning out how I expected it to, but uh, part of the fun is figuring out how to fix all your mistakes. The nice thing about brakes like this is that they are super easy to fix. Just a little bit of glue, some clamping force, and you'll never know what happened. All right, I'm pooped, it's late. I can leave this overnight to dry and then we're gonna pick this back up tomorrow. But before we do that, let me tell you about the sponsor of today's video, Squarespace. Squarespace is an all-in-one website hosting and creation service. When I started my podcast, Off The Cut, we needed to get a website up and running for it quick. But between Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, and the podcast itself, I just didn't know when I was gonna find the time to get it done. Thankfully, Squarespace had my back. Their website creation tool was so easy to use that I had our website up and running in an afternoon. Their pre-made templates gave me a fantastic jumping off point in terms of design. They've got e-commerce integration for selling both physical and digital goods. And when I was ready to register the actual domain, offthecutpodcast.com, they made it as easy as a simple button click. It's not normally that easy. Trust me, I've done it the hard way before in the past. If you're looking to start a website for your business, passion project, or just next creative endeavor, I can highly recommend Squarespace. Check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And then when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Zach Builds to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. All right, let's get back to this build. There we go. 24 hours later and this thing is looking much more solid. It's feeling a lot better in the hand. So now we can move on to cutting some acrylic. You know, I was gonna cut this over on the CNC, but then I realized why bother? I can just cut it much faster and much easier right here on the table saw. The original design of this speaker had one huge flaw that I intended to correct. It had solid wood side panels. I mean, how crazy is that? You couldn't even appreciate the amazing shape of the horn chamber. So I decided to replace them with clear acrylic. That way you get to see all the cool internals, just like on my Everything Console Mark III build. So this one goes on here like so, and then uh, this one goes on there like that. So now we just have to find a way to attach them. And what I landed on was using some small brass screws, which on their own I think are a great pairing to go with a walnut, but they also match the speaker driver quite nicely as well but we'll talk more about that in a second. There we go. That feels a little bit more sturdy now. It's got some support the whole way around. Let's trim down some of this excess uh, acrylic. Sweet. Some of you no doubt noticed that my acrylic panels didn't perfectly fit the speaker cabinets. I actually intentionally made them a bit big to make their installation easier. And now using the belt sander, I sanded off the excess, giving them a perfectly flush fit. Look at that, that is a thing of beauty. Next, I made a really stupid choice here and cut this big slot in the back of the cabinet one blade width at a time. Honestly, I have no idea what I was thinking here, and I'll address it more later in the video, but this extra wide dado is eventually going to be where I install the rear I.O. panel for the speaker amp, Bluetooth receiver, and power source. And then, of course, I needed a place to put the speaker driver, so I cut a three and a half inch hole right smack in the middle of the front of the cabinet. There she is. Not the cleanest hole, if I'm honest, but you know what? At least it didn't break. We can definitely fix any little rough edges in there. Overall, not bad. Oh, and I also needed to cut out a little notch for wire management, so I marked it out with a knife and then promptly chiseled out way too much wood because 
well, I'm just not that good with hand tools, but it was nothing a little dab of CA glue couldn't fix. All right, so at this point, I think that's about all we can do in terms of like, you know, sculpting the body. And now, before we get into doing all the electronics, I'd like to take a second and just apply the finish so that this can be drying while we're doing the electronic stuff. I thought this step was gonna be easy, but eh, not so much. Just like with the glue, all of those tight inside corners were a real pain to navigate. In hindsight, I think I would have been better off just running some water-based polyurethane through a sprayer. It would have been a lot faster, plus it would have dried quicker too. Okay, well this thing is absolutely drenched in oil now, but they say that's actually pretty good for the PolyX finish. It's supposed to self-level and dry out pretty nice, so I guess now the thing to do is a little bit of electronic work. For this build, we are going full DIY. I scoured the depths of AliExpress to get all of these parts. So if that didn't seem like I was absolutely dripping with enthusiasm in that last scene, it's because I was feeling pretty nervous because, well, I didn't know if all these parts were gonna work together or not. So the first thing we had to do was start with power, which was supplied via this 12 volt barrel plug. But that wouldn't work for our Bluetooth receiver module, which runs on just five volts. So I had to step down the voltage with this cute little guy. Then we were ready to connect the Bluetooth board, which receives a digital signal from your phone and converts it into an analog signal that a speaker can play. Okay, quick sanity check. Let's plug this in. Okay, LED light there. Ooh, another LED, okay. Guys, I think I'm like competent at soldering or something. <laughs> Let's see, can we connect to this little Bluetooth module? What would it be called? This is like some random little Bluetooth chip from China. Uh, it's called VHM314. We are connected. Okay, well, now we gotta go from the Bluetooth module to the amp, and then we can test and see if we can get some sound output out of it. On its own, the Bluetooth module is nowhere near powerful enough to move a speaker driver. So to give it a hand, I also bought this 50 watt amplifier. Two wires go from the amp back to the female barrel plug to feed it with power, and then these two yellow wires supply the analog signal from the Bluetooth module. The final step was soldering a couple leads onto the speaker driver, and then I was ready to test it. Theoretically, this should be the last connection that we have to make. I don't know, what do you guys think? It's gonna work for a shot. It's a lot of connections, a lot of things that could go wrong. Okay, connected for audio. Here we go, wish me luck. I mean, I can't play this music for copyright reasons, but trust me, it works. Once I knew the electronics worked, I was able to start measuring the final piece of the puzzle, that rear I.O. panel. I'm using a set of calipers here because I had to include some cutouts for the 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, the volume knob, as well as the power port, all of which had to be precisely located. And since accuracy was so important, rather than trying to cut it myself, I employed the precision of my x carve. A few minutes later, I had a freshly cut panel and I was ready to start piecing everything together. Oh man, I can't believe I made it this far without talking about this sweet three and a half inch driver. Not only does it look awesome, but it's also capable of producing a full range of sounds. One thing that you want to watch out for when shopping for a driver this small is that you don't accidentally end up with a tweeter or a mid-range woofer. They can honestly look pretty similar at times, so just make sure that whatever you buy is labeled as full range. This next part, I'm almost too embarrassed to share. I really wish that I came up with a more elegant solution for mounting all these electronic components in the back of the speaker, but basically, I just hot glued them all in place. Don't get me wrong, it all works just fine and nothing shorted out, but like all projects, this one was a learning experience, and if I had to do it all again, I would do this and a few other things differently. So I actually added a little postmortem breakdown at the end of the video. Well, if I'm honest, that was a complete pain in the ass to assemble, however, I am very excited to do this big reveal. Oh yeah. Look at that. That makes it all worth it. What do you say? Take this thing home, see how it sounds. Oh man, that sounds really good, especially for such a small driver. But that doesn't mean it's perfect. So let's talk about a few of the things we could do differently for a version 2.0 of this build. 
The first one is quite easy. I don't know what the hell I was thinking with this rear panel when I cut it into the side panels. I should have just made it so that it slots between them. That was a weird choice. Second, there's definitely some room for improvement with all the electronics here. I think what I should have done is mounted them all to a single breadboard, and then that way I could have cleaned up a lot of the wiring. And then also I could have then mounted that breadboard to the rear panel and slotted this whole rear electronics area in as one assembly. Third, it would have been a good idea to get some sound dampening material here behind the main driver and the main speaker cabinet, but because of the clear acrylic side panels, it would have to be something that actually looked good. And then finally, I do worry about the air seal the whole way around the speaker cabinet. Because these clear acrylic side panels are just sitting against the wood, they don't create the best seal. And when I have the volume turned all the way up on this, I can actually hear them rattling around a little bit. So my solution would be to route a little channel into the wood and then fill it with some sort of foam gasket that can then form an airtight seal on the side panels and I think that would make this thing sound a lot better, especially at high volumes. Putting aside those little changes though, I am absolutely thrilled with how this thing turned out. Not only does it look amazing, but it also sounds great too. And in general, I am just super excited to check out all of the different speaker builds that are available on Thingiverse and in the 3D printing community. I don't think it's an overstatement to say that this update for Easel is an absolute game changer. Yes, there were some small little hiccups that I had to work around. However, they weren't really that bad and they were a heck of a lot better than designing something like this from scratch. Speaking of which, I wanna say a huge shout out to Guppy K on Thingiverse for coming up with the original design for this speaker and a huge shout out to you at home for watching this video. Cause that's it for me, I am basically done. I will include some links uh, to all the products I use down in the video description and also big thank you to all my Patreon supporters. You guys rock and I will see you in the next video. Peace.